When my mother met my new girlfriend, Wendy, she exclaimed, life will never be dull with that girl. And you know, that's absolutely true. She was right on. There has never been a dull moment. It's lasted 38 years so far, and the woman has continued to impress me in all kinds of ways, including not long ago, this wife of mine became a long distance runner of all things. So she dazzled me yet again. And now I'm something of an athlete. I've always imagined myself to be that. After all, I taught high impact aerobics for five years. And so we were on vacation in Maui not long ago, and Wendy decided to go for this long run along the beach. And I thought, well, I would just join her. Well, it quickly became evident that I, who thought I was in such great shape, wasn't, for there was no way I could keep up with her. Gasping for breath, I was barely able to say to her, keep going, don't wait for me. Like, I'm not going to hold her back. So she continued on, leaving me in the sand where I had that kind of like beached whale feeling. <clears throat> But I, as I said, I wasn't going to hold her back. She, who was born to run, I couldn't hold her back. And I've never subscribed anyway to the, uh, this idea that someone should hold herself back so that nobody will feel like a loser and everybody can participate in some kind of like shared mediocrity. Like, let's find the lowest, con lowest common denominator between us and celebrate that. Like, nobody goes ahead of anybody else. Like, forget that. My feeling is, if you're behind, you know, the fact is, you're behind. It, you feel like a beached whale? Well, you're a beached whale. And that's how it is. And if you're a loser, well, you know what? You're a loser. And it's not that everybody has to win and not everybody deserves a prize. So that's not my philosophy. My, my feeling is if you've got the gift, if you've got the talent, if you've got the will, you've got the aspiration, then you go and you go hard and do me a favor by leaving me behind. Allow me to be the unfit straggler that I am. It gives me the chance to contemplate the pathetic shape I'm in. Realizing my sorry condition, it's then up to me to determine to do something about it or not. It's my choice. So I'm not going to hold you back because I feel threatened by your success. No way. You take off, you run hard, and do not look back. So set my wife free on that day. Go ahead. You keep going. And this inspired runner, runner, my wife, Wendy, in no time at all, she became this like speck in the distance. And that image of her getting smaller and smaller until vanishing in the distance, that image has stayed with me. And it became a source of inspiration. Like I happen to love it that she was able to take off in that way and leave me behind. For I never wanted to be married to some kind of slug who would merely fall along behind me. I've rather liked the idea of her taking off in some way, in her way, and I take off in my way. And each of us become for each other. We exist to be the cheerleader or the fan, the, the best cheerleader that the other has. So married to such a creature as Wendy, I've never thankfully had to struggle to bring some poor thing along because of an absence of desire or determination. Rather, the question has only ever been whether I can keep up. And if I can't keep up, well, at least not to stand in the way. So as she left me back on the beach, as pathetic as I felt, I honestly was thinking, Look, dear one, you go ahead in your gloriously... She had these new Vibrams barefoot running shoes. They, she got them in pink, so she loved them. And she had this cutesy little outfit. And she was listening to lectures from the teaching company. So, like, she's not only working out with the body, she's educating the mind as well. Like, it's, it's multi-dimensional prospect vanishing off into the, into the distance. And I was really proud of that. Early in our marriage, I had bought a book for her. and It was called Particular Passions. It had to do with women finding their particular vocation. You know, what is it you're really passionate about? I've always wanted her to, to find her particular passion, to live her dream, and to become, in a way, a speck, of, a speck in the distance by achieving something and thereby being an inspiration for other people. Like, go, you go hard. Now, that sense of discovering your particular passion, like what you're here for, like this is a really crucial question. Like it really matters. 
of the mysteries of human nature, says psychologist James Hillman, one of the greatest is what he calls the question of character and destiny. Hillman's the author of a great book. It's called The Soul's Code. And he proposes that our calling in life is inborn. Like what you're meant to be is written into your nature. It's your mission to uncover that and to bring it forth. It's a divine imperative. There's only been one you and there'll never be another. So find you and be you. Hillman states, that just as the oak tree's destiny is contained in the tiny acorn, your destiny is coded seed-like into the very nature of your being. So he calls it the acorn theory. Hillman rages, it's really fascinating to read the book, like he just rages against those psychologies where the focus has predominantly been upon people analyzing their past, their childhoods, their memories, their parents, you know, it's like what my mom did to me, whatever, while ignoring who and what they were born to be. His conclusion upon surveying all the evidence that all of the probing analysis has not accomplished anything. And it's the title of one of the books he's written that I have on the shelf behind me here. It's entitled, great title for a book, We've Had a Hundred Years of Psychotherapy and the World's Getting Worse. So Hilmer is so angry at the debilitating cosmology that is behind the the psychology, like the worldview that's behind the psychology. He calls, he says this view, like it's the view that's been largely accepted by the scientific community and probably accepted by vast numbers of people that we are all but products of blind impersonal forces. And therefore, I mean, since, you know, it's all been like a blind evolutionary process, we're all accidents of the universe. In a sense, we're flukes of the universe with no right to be here. Based on that view, there's no reason, says Hellman, for anyone to be here or even to do anything. Like if it's just all impersonal behind it all, there's no point to it. There's no sense the, of, of there being any destiny or guidance. It's just, it's just happening, that's all. Well, in contrast to that view, Hillman thinks that we should bring back Plato's idea that you come into the world with a destiny. Like that's so inspiring. And Hillman then says that the role of a parent is to recognize his or her child's particular destiny. So to that end, he suggests that a parent stop saying, this is my child, and instead to ask, who is this child? Who is this child who happens to be mine? In particular, Hillman states that the role of the parent is to keep an eye out for specific instances when the child's destiny shows itself. As for instance, if he's offering up some resistance at school for some reason, or he has an obsession with something or other, he wants, Hillman wants the parent to, be, to take note of strange or unusual behavior because behind it, there may be clues pointing to a particular destiny. So particular, what he calls symptoms that recur repeatedly may be what he calls the most important part of the kid. Hillman's full of all kinds of advice for parents. He says, the worst atmosphere for a six-year-old is one in which there are no expectations whatsoever. The child who grows up in an atmosphere of acceptance and tolerance grows up in a vacuum. He's therefore completely against placid environments where the effort is made to smooth the child out, to make him what? To make him nice, like to make him socially acceptable, which in effect, he says, stifles and consumes the child's life and spirit. The child's uniqueness can be consumed, can be wiped out, swallowed up by a parent who passively says, whatever you do is all right, and I'm sure you'll succeed. Like, yuck. Hillman calls this kind of attitude a statement of disinterest. The parent is saying, in effect, I really have no dreams for you at all. So a good parent, in contrast, according to James Hillman, should have some dream about his or her child's future. Good parents have a vision for their child's potential. Perhaps, for instance, you've got a young Winston Churchill in the crib. Will the parent see that or not? You're a certain person, says James Hillman, and that person begins to show up early in your life. 
So when little Winston Churchill was a schoolboy, he had a lot of trouble with language. He didn't speak well. Well, what did that mean? Did that point to anything or was he just a problem? Well, you know, they put him in a special class because of that. This boy who had trouble with words and writing and speech, well, we know one day he was going to win the Nobel Prize for Literature and would be instrumental in saving the Western world through well-chosen words spoken on the radio to the British people. Hillman suggests that Churchill struggled with words, could not speak easily, because he had an overwhelming sense of the power of words. Something in young Winston knew that his future had to do with words. Something in him knew what he would become. In his early teens, he simply was not ready for the weight of that knowledge. It was too much for him to carry. Well, the story is told of a 15-year-old girl who prepared to dance at an amateur show. Friends and family gathered to see her debut. However, when the, the spotlight shone upon her, she found that she couldn't move. She was frozen to the spot. The girl then crossed the stage and whispered something into the ear of the master of ceremonies. The MC then came back to the group to, uh, to address the crowd gathered there and said there'd been a change in the program. He said, Ella, there's been a change. Ella's not going to dance for us. She's going to sing. And Ella Fitzgerald, who had never before sung in public, sang her heart out and brought the house down. James Hillman, in that wonderful book, The Soul's Code, explains that Ella Fitzgerald couldn't dance on that occasion because she wasn't meant to. Ella was born to dance. <laughs> she was born to sing, not to dance. It is for each of us to discover, you know, what were we born to be and do?